experience uh, to share technical vision, architectural leadership to different kind of companies. So uh, let's welcome Rob. So yep, let me uh, accept in. Okay. Hello. There we go. Hello. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, hello. Yeah, hello. So uh, can you try to share your screen so that, uh, yeah, you can continue your, your presentation? Let's see here. Okay, so we can see your, your screen now, but uh, maybe, yeah, you can, yeah. Okay, good. So oh, let, let me pass the time to you. Okay, thank okay. you. So you can see the slides okay? Yeah, 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 it's okay. Okay, great. All right, so hi, everybody. Uh, we, we hear a lot about securing APIs, and that's very important. Uh, kind of, I, of course, we've, we've done that very well, one of the uh, top-ranked API management solutions for a long time by the analysts for security. But this talk is more about how do you secure the life cycle itself? How do you make sure that bad APIs aren't being exposed or that you're unaware of APIs that are being exposed in production that can do damage? Uh, it turns out that uh, a lot of people aren't very confident in their security organization's ability to detect whether or not there's bad access to APIs. And about half the people aren't even sure their security team knows all the APIs that exist. There's lots of uh, sort of rogue <laughs> environments and developers exposing APIs uh, through corporate firewalls. And uh, sometimes IT doesn't know about that. Sometimes not very well tracked, not very well secured. That causes a lot of problems. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about in the next 20 minutes or so is that you don't just secure the APIs themselves. You need to secure the life cycle. You need to know how new APIs are created, how they're getting exposed, how you can secure the, the process itself, how you can automate and keep the, the workflows and the, the deployment of new versions of APIs and new APIs themselves safe and well-tracked and managed and do that fast. Do it with CI, CD, DevOps. Don't slow down the process, but keep the process secure. That's really what's, what's important. So quick intro on me, uh, Rodko, CTO for Force Software. I'm a CTO at RogueWave Software before that, founder of and uh, CTO of OpenLogic, and work at a bunch of large and small companies, work with a lot of analysts and speak at uh, worldwide conferences. Uh, I was hoping to go to Singapore for the first time for this conference, so <laughs> maybe next time. All right, so how do new APIs originate? How do they get created? Well, a few main paths. One, new business channels for companies exploring and moving to digital transformation. That's often um, new channels created to take advantage of new ecosystems, new partnerships, uh, digital marketplaces, new ways to share data, to try to um, find new revenue streams, make it easier for people to interact with your business, new partners, things like that. So it's business driven. Second one would be web mobile applications. Developers constantly adding new APIs for app purposes, back end as a front end, uh, optimizing data flow, maybe there's uh, GraphQL involved, REST, so XML, JMS, there's lots of different ways to expose existing data, data some legacy, some modern, to your web and mobile apps. And then the third, customer needs, specific large customers often, special partners, they would need their own private access, uh, special APIs, special data that they're only allowed to see, sensitive data maybe, maybe it's proprietary in nature, but you share it with special partners. So lots of ways APIs can come about that are important to secure. So let's talk for a minute about why it's important to think about security first when it comes to API management strategy, why OK is not good enough. I think this should be pretty um, common, I think, to most people. We constantly see data being lost, the data being exposed, sensitive data being exposed, and, and big companies, you know, and the, the examples here, T-Mobile, Google, Salesforce, right? Breaches all the time, no end in sight, and sometimes even seemingly innocuous APIs. They, they seem like they're safe, but hackers can leverage safe, non-sensitive APIs to get to much more sensitive data and do a lot more damage. So security is critical for every 
API you expose, even if you think um, you're not advertising it, it's not public, hackers can find it very easily and do a lot of damage, even if the API itself maybe doesn't expose much data. If it's not very well secured, it can open the door to other attacks. And what, what makes this complex is the number of moving parts today. You know, we, you'll see and hear lots of talks uh, during the conference about microservices and service mesh and API. Fact is, there are tons and tons of APIs out there that you're you're typically exposing. It used to be a few, then a few dozen, then a few hundred. You may have thousands exposed across the organization. And a lot of companies moving to microservices, I think mistakenly <laughs> expose each microservice as a public API, which is not a very good idea, but it does happen. So you have ideally a sophisticated API management layer on top that lets you design and share and comment and, and take your APIs through workflows, get approvals, right? You deal with your integrations, you have development or development portal, business portals. So the right people have the right kind of access that's completely secured with standard policies across the board. It doesn't matter what language you're using, what platform you're using, where the developers are in the world, they all should be secured exactly the same way consistently and managed from single points. So it's, uh, you don't run the risk of having lots of different entry points that are each done a little bit differently. That's a, a nightmare for security. With traffic management, business analytics, et cetera, all on top kind of protecting all those internal microservices and whether you're on cloud, on premises or some hybrid, doesn't matter, you want the standard API management layer front. So you can do your CI, CD, move fast, um, but still be protected. Okay, so how do you prevent rogue services from getting deployed? How do you avoid uh, having developers accidentally or intentionally expose um, new APIs? How do you secure the processes? And again, still go fast, right? We don't want to slow things down because you, you've got to get out into the market with what you're doing as quickly as possible. When we think about API lifecycle management that spans the entire process from the, the planning up front, what data should we expose, who can get access to it, what controls do they have, what fields can they see, when can they access it, all those kind of uh, planning efforts up front should be governed. Moving on to development, what protocols, what what security level, what data should be uh, redacted, and what can be audited, who's going to be shared with, right? operational metrics, analytics, all the runtime controls. And then underlying all of that, and I think this is critically important, is policies. Not one-off policies that are separate for every API, but blanket policies that automatically protect everything, every single API, worldwide, no matter what language, where it's deployed, the same way, so you have the same kind of control. Then you can tweak those and, and maybe add additional policies for so, certain things are more sensitive than others and need maybe more encryption or there's sensitive data, financial data, healthcare data that need additional scrutiny and protections. That's fine, but everything gets a base layer of standard policies and protection. We'll talk about what that means in a bit. So a couple main components of lifecycle management, the way we think of it. One is a lifecycle manager, right? A, sort of a steady machine. Automate machine-based, role-based validations and sign off workflows across the lifecycle. So you have the right people approve things when needed and, and sign off so they can go to the next state. Then you have what we think of as a lifecycle coordinator, the concept of once Typically, a human has approved something, you want to automatically affect the environment, make the changes to configuration, promote from one environment to the next, eliminate hands-on. You don't want individual DevOps people, release management people, system administrators, changing things by hand is a recipe for uh, failure, security issues, failing audits. It's a really bad idea. And then finally, a repository with the extensible meta metadata Every app user is different. You need different levels of control, granularity, hierarchical management, federation, all those kind of controls so you can customize 
these workflows exactly what you need for your environment. So here's an example, kind of an approval process. You're moving from requirements to design to development, where on the left, a developer submits an idea for a new API. So they, they submit the idea, maybe it needs to, and this is a sample process, this could be whatever you need for your, your company, your environment. But in this case, a local architect on the team needs to approve. And if they approve it, then the API can be published and moves to the next step, right? Into the, the design phase. How are we going to implement this? The developer maybe updates it, submits uh, a draft design, right? It can be uh, go through an automated process to get to the next step, maybe data augmentation, right? Automatic controls being enforced. Then you need an approval again if it doesn't work. Go back to step one. If it does get approved, now you can start developing, nail down your, your REST, your GraphQL, whatever your endpoint might be, and continue the process. So some automated mixed with some manual workflow, whatever the mix makes sense for your environment, you can enforce that with, uh, with the Econo lifecycle. And the important bit is to remember that we don't want to slow things down. So CI, CD is in the mix, so Jenkins, what have you. Developers can go fast, run their test, write code. It's only at certain checkpoints that you want to have potentially humans in the loop, like a DevOps person or a, uh, a release management person, a QA type person to say, um, in order to go from the development environment to the QA environment or from QA to staging or from staging to production, there's certain gates that you need sign off from an enterprise architect, sign off from the security team whatever that may be. Uh, once you get the sign off, you want to do the promotion automatically. And why that's so important is if you look at a modern deployment environment where you have maybe regulatory needs, financial for sure, um, healthcare, anything where you've got sensitive data, a lot of these standards um, like PCI compliance for financial or, or HIPAA, there, there's lots of worldwide standards, but they're very similar. If you want to protect data, you have to do things like isolating the environment. So in this case, we've got in big red there, production, staging, development, test. These are physically isolated. The networks are not connected. It's impossible to go from staging to production, for example, directly. It's only through sort of a sideband channel that you can communicate with those environments. And that's why we think it's so important to have something like lifecycle management and coordination so that when you promote something, let's say from the staging to the production environment, that that automated software is essentially replicating what was approved in staging into the production environment and automatically applying the changes to, to networking, to who has access, to policies that must be enforced. All that's done automatically, no manual labor and no direct access between those networks. If you have direct access, you've got a security issue. Okay, so how does this fit into your existing architecture? Well, if you look at the big red box in the center, you know, most people think of API gateways there, and that's that's what you want. It protects, it's kind of your API firewall to protect all those incoming requests. You know, any hacker in the world can attack your endpoint as soon as it's exposed. So that API firewall, uh, protects you, enforces security, converts data formats, you know, XML to JSON and, you know, handles OAuth and OpenID and all the SAML, all the kind of conversions from data from different protocols, formats, traffic management, all done for you there. Again, rock solid security being absolutely critical, but there's more to it. You also want developer portal access. You know, where do you sign up for APIs to use them, to track them, to manage them, to get analytics both on the technical side as well as the business side? You, know, you want to know about uptime and latencies, but you also want to know, is it helping the business? Are we making money with this API? How much money? What are we doing? What kind of business? What are the partners that are using this? All that is a critical part of API management. So don't think of it as, as just the gateway. It's the entire end-to-end uh, -end solution is what's critical. So some examples, I mentioned policies a few times, some standard policies. For example, in Econa, we can apply protection for all the OWASP 
top 10 security issues for API specifically, the OWASP API security, right? So those are the, the kind of things on the left there that we can automatically present, prevent a lot of those attacks. So again, you, you want to have an API management solution like this that automatically enforces all these policies. No one has to remember to turn them on, just automatically happens. And then you can add more on top if you like. Another example, malicious pattern detection looking for SQL injection, looking for JavaScript injection, automatically blocking those attacks, automatically uh, maintaining quality of service. Like those are the kind of uh, policies you might want to attach to all your APIs or some subset, maybe you have the internal use and external use. You can decide which, which policies to apply where. So what does it look like to have a security first approach in lifecycle management? What we do, a quick uh, sort of slide demo here to show you what that might look like. In this case, we'll have three simple environments, you know, test, development, test, and an acceptance area, a staging environment, where a solution architect, maybe for the product or for the development team, needs to approve before it can exit the development area and move to test. And in this case, an enterprise architect and IT security are notified and they can comment Maybe they're not strictly required to approve, but at least they're notified. And then solution architect is required to go from test to the staging environment. And finally, I'll show an example of just a minor version of upgrade where the API owner can do that, that promotion from the development area. So this, again, just as a sample, this workflow can be anything that makes sense in your environment, it can be automated, and you can have manual steps in the process to sign off as well. So in this case, the developer creates a new API through developer portal and says, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to create this new demo API. It's in development. Makes a request to get it approved to move to the next phase. Solution architect can approve that and also send off notification to enterprise architect, IT security for comment. All those comments can be tracked, managed in one place in the portal. Approvals get tracked, rejections get tracked, all the comments. So it's not an email chain in spreadsheets and things that can get lost. It's all kept and audited and tracked in the system, which is very important for compliance and, and regulated environments. And then the workflow can initiate this auto promotion once it's been signed off by the architect. Then the system steps in, does the automatic promotion, moves the API to the test environment, again, makes all those network changes, token changes, access changes, et cetera. So humans don't have to have all those passwords in their head and keys uh, on their local drives, things like that. This is all in the API management platform. And then the API can get promoted to the acceptance area. And once it's signed off by a solution architect, again, can track uh, all the requests that go back and forth with development. Have you done this? Do you remember that? Get it done, get it documented and then do the automatic promotion. So that's really the, the theme here. And then eventually you get uh, the, the, the tenant itself, its multi-tenant system gets updated with the new APIs. And if you need a new, a new version for an API, a kind of a minor, minor change, an API owner can do that and track and manage it. So that's all about API lifecycle man management. If you want to get started with Akana, uh, we have a uh, kind of a quick start package you can use. We do offer pure in the cloud, completely on premises or hybrid models where you can have kind of the best of both worlds and deploy your APIs where you want and still manage your, your APIs and your policies uh, where you want as well. So you can choose a combination of on-prem and in the cloud. And so I, I think the takeaway is uh, make sure you're securing your APIs. Yes, that's critically important. But don't forget to secure the process. To keep the process of promoting APIs secure means don't do it manually. Make sure you, um, you have automated, repeatable software to be able to, to advance APIs from one environment to the next. And uh, you don't have to rely on slow processes or lots of manual labor, which is uh, it, it's slow and dangerous. So that's my, my takeaway. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, um, yeah, a very good sharing, and it's very interesting. So, um, another uh, and a question from from us. So, um, you you mentioned about the importance in the development uh, process and how to invite pitches. So, uh, uh, is there any any experience from you that um any un very unexpected uh, 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 uh example that you can see previously that uh, you can share to us? Uh, yeah, this is something that uh how to manage the unexpected is very interesting. So. Can you share one of the maybe the most unexpected scenario you can see due to the the pitches or the development process? Um, yeah, I think uh, so. One of the you know examples we've seen is um, one of the the major analysts that we work with uh, saw some some serious uh, damage by a, a security hack mm. of an API, and when the the customer went to figure out what was wrong, they couldn't find a record of that API. And in fact, their IT group didn't know it existed. And it turned out that developers had uh, essentially exposed that API to the internet and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> big, big problem. <laughs> so they yeah, wound yeah. up getting hacked through something they didn't even know they had. Mm, okay, got that, got that. Yep. So, um, yep. I think that's that's the pretty much from the question from us. So, uh, thanks for our time again. So, uh, yeah. So, I I, I said so. Uh, you can also share your personal contact in the in the in the chat so people can uh, reach you out offline. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. So.